Environmental Science Public Ownership GIS UAS Primer. My name is Katie Strain. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. I study environmental science and I'm in my fourth year. I'm in the College of Natural Sciences. I hope to go on to get a, a PhD in ecology. Hello, my name is Andrew Vanderheiden. I'm currently pursuing a BS degree in environmental geosciences in the College of Geosciences at Texas A&M. The purpose of this project is to demonstrate the efficacy of potential applications of affordable unmanned aerial systems and personal GIS as land managers seek to improve sustainability, resilience, and environmental impact of their property. Okay, so Andrew, our problem is that a history of fire suppression and overgrazing in Texas has caused conditions favorable, favorable to woody encroachers such as ash juniper or juniper species to convert grassland into woodland and to dominate previously open areas. This decreases the foraging value of the land and for many landowners um, decreases accessibility of their property. Many central Texas landowners clear their juniper on their property to preserve valuable open areas. Our process will use UAS to identify encroaching junipers and automatically mark a waypoint within the personal GIS to aid in removal. So the equipment we used was a DJI Phantom 3 drone, a personal Garmin GPS unit, and the Drone Deploy online service. Andrew, can you show us our area of interest? Yes, so our study site was in Rumley, Texas, north, northwest of, of Austin. So we flew three cal calibration flights on this hillside where the cedar was, was more sparse, and then ran a more detailed flight with, with several tree, tree species over here across the river. So why do you remove cedar on your property? For one thing, cedar uses up some of the groundwater, and uh, we need all we can get in Central Texas because it's kind of a somewhat of an arid area. We get into droughts, and uh, then also with cedar, and nothing hardly grows under a cedar tree. It just ruins the land, in my opinion. It takes up space. It takes up grazing uh, space for the cattle and so forth. So uh, they, it has some uses in that uh, certain wildlife utilizes the cedar certain types of environments with uh, in combination with oak trees and so forth for the so can you describe maybe like the process of how you remove your cedars or like where you keep them and where you don't we've, re we've removed most of them over the years and uh, we did this by some mostly we have come in and just uh, done it with chainsaws and uh, rented a dozer for a couple of weeks on different occasions and I would go through and, and push the cedars over there um, and so some sometimes I do that but a lot of times I just do it with chainsaws. How would like knowing prior like you being able to gauge your own density help in the process of removing cedars? Well I mean if I didn't have a significant density, you know, I, I wouldn't really have any reason to take it off other than trying to control it on the regrowth before it got too bad. And uh, so, I, you know, I, it's not much of a problem at first other than the fact that you don't want to get it, let it get ahead of you too much. Um, but I can gauge pretty well like we've got regrowth now in, in different places and uh, sometimes I think about, well, maybe I need to get the NRSC involved too, but uh, it's such small acreage and what have you that I haven't really pursued that. And, uh, because you, 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 there's red berries and blueberry cedars, and the uh, 
the blueberries are actually easier to control because they kind of have a single uh, trunk and um, you can cut them off at the base down below any of the uh, forage and what have you and and cut them off and you you've pretty well taken care of that particular plant but the red berries have multiple uh, trunks so to speak coming out of the ground and you have to pretty much uh, somehow dig those up or you can spray them and kill the whole plant but otherwise you have to pretty well grub them up and they're much more challenging to control but the berries that uh, they produce of course they fall on the ground and there's millions and millions of them and then the birds and the wildlife eat them and then especially the birds well they uh, they distribute them all over the country and then they the birds will get in the trees and then they they'll pass those seeds through and drop them on the ground under the trees and then that's a problem in that you can't spray those because when you do most of the sprays will affect the trees that you don't want to damage so in that case you have to get under there pretty much with in hand cut those but uh, the birds do a good job of uh, spreading the cedars around some areas uh, are so thick that I can't even really walk through there and the drones uh, help to identify them and, and have the concentration and then also um, you know that's evidence if you're trying to work with a program to take that in and show that to the uh, the powers that be like the NRCS or whoever might uh, want evidence that you have a thick concentration of the cedar just which would justify maybe financial aid and so forth at our calibration site we had three different juniper flights at three different altitudes to see if there was a, di a difference in the resulting image but there wasn't we looked at ndi or vari but it's an indicator of plant health and if we look at the spectrum, we found that 0.2 to 0.4 is the ideal range for viewing juniper. So if we look at 0.2, which is on our screen here, um, you can see that you can easily see which juniper individuals are there. So if we can zoom in on one juniper individual, Andrew, that would be wonderful. Um, so you can see these two images. If you can toggle between the 2D map and the plant health, you can really pick out which are junipers in this plant health image. Mm -hmm. And what was really interesting, Katie, was how the cedars could even poke out in some of these thickets of, of uh, other trees here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so we were interested in wondering, because Mike was describing how the seed dispersal from birds can cause undergrowth underneath larger canopy like, um, like live oak. And so when we look at these live oaks here, you can see little green splashes, so we were interested in knowing if this was a false positive or if it was actually cedar regrowth. Um, so we did cross-section this image with five sections. Um, and between the junipers that we did count in, in our transect and then the junipers that Andrew, you counted in this image, yeah. um, we found that we had a 95% capture rate of the junipers that were in this area. So if we want to zoom over to our, our test flights, we looked at an area that was a little bit more dense with like more variety in the vegetation, in the vegetation community. Um, we, Dr. Mulliken has done a really good job of clearing on this side. So if you look at the plant health index, it's pretty sparse, even though the vegetation is very thick. So he has been doing some work in this area. Um, mm -hmm. Then, but we can still see some some clear examples of cedar over here on on the riverbank here. We can see this individual tree here. If we turn on plant health, it shows up very very clearly. Yeah, and you can see these large individuals. And if you go to there's in the center of this image, there's um there's a live oak thicket that we're really interested in because we do see in the center of the live oak right here. 
that there is a lot of green picked up on the plant health map. So we're really interested in seeing, once again, if these false positives are truly juniper undergrowth or if they are just a false positive. So to, in order to assess this, Andrew, you and I went out and tagged 20 individuals for each of the three predominant species that we saw. What, what species were those? We saw ash juniper, um, cedar elm, and live oak, which are the three that made up the most of the vegetation community here. Mm -hmm. And then this this could really be really be a, a important and powerful tool for a lot of land 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 landowners. Um, it could have a lot of applications. Um, it could help people plan out um, their their uh, cedar removal processes or or even assess the 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 the, the effectiveness of their ongoing removal. So overall, this is a very simple process for us to complete. Um, we pursued, we purchased a consumer grade drone from Walmart for five hundred dollars. Yeah. It was a Phantom Three, and then what was the GPS that we used? So the GPS unit we used was just a consumer grade handheld Garmin GPS unit, uh, and then we just signed 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 up for a drone deploy account here. And drone deploy really did a lot of, 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 of all of our heavy lifting. Wonderful. So this is just about with between our like our purchases and our methods and the software that we use, we really try to put the hands this in the hands of a landowner that is really interested in taking cedar removal into their own hands. And our drone was piloted by an FAA 107 certified pilot.